Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 32. Success against the odds and spiders. The Post this week asks that just for a moment you suspend your disbelief. Your disbelief that you can succeed against the odds. Your disbelief that an individual's higher education can transform not only that individual but the life and chances of a nation. And you suspend your disbelief that one person with grit, with determination and with courage can change the world. We live in anti-intellectual times. All the cliches work against the importance of a university. Why go to a university? It's expensive, you're not going to get a job anyway. When you go to university, you're just wasting time. And I know so many of our contemporary movements, policies and agendas work against understanding the value of higher education, the value of our universities to individuals but also to the nations that fund them. And we rarely think these days about how the university education of one person can not only change that one person but can change a nation. So today we're going to talk about a person who believed that higher education can be transformative and a person who lived that life of courage, of hard work, determination and transformative success. Now I know books about university life are rare. Novels like David Lodge's Changing Places, Kingsley Amos's Lucky Jim, Evelyn Waugh's Bride's Head Revisited, and those films like Goodwill Hunting or Shadowlands. This type of high culture, but also popular culture, configures an ideology of a university being a place apart, disconnected from everyday life. Indeed, the ivory tower, to use that truly dreadful cliche. So what we need, we need new stories of university life, complicated truths, not allowing the narratives of the easy pathway through life to survive. Because our students, our colleagues, have the right to know and understand this very different present and future of higher education. Now, one of these remarkably different stories was created by Brenda Hale, the Right Honourable Baroness Hale of Richmond. She explored her life in universities and beyond in her autobiography, Spider Woman. Now, you may know this person, even if you didn't quite recognise the name, you will know who she is in about 30 seconds. Because certainly she lived an entire professional and personal life of grit, of courage, of hard work and determination. But she is known <laughs> only like a very, very few people are known in popular culture. And she's known brilliantly for staring down authority, for when her moment arose that she did the right thing. And, bizarrely, wonderfully, while she was doing the right thing, she was wearing a spider brooch while she was doing it. Now, rarely will any of us in our entire lives ever be the centre of the world just for a moment. But Brenda Hale was, just for a moment, the centre of the world and she was wearing a spider brooch when she did it. So in September 2019, 30 million people watched 
the streamed proceedings from the Supreme Court's website and 11 judges unanimously ruled that the Prime Minister of the time had unlawfully prorogued Parliament in the run up to, up to the October 31 Brexit deadline. So this ruling was an exploration about the relationship between parliamentary responsibility and parliamentary accountability. And the court argued that the suspension of parliament prevented parliament from carrying out its constitutional duties. Wow, okay. This was a moment in the history of constitutional law. But it was also a moment of thinking and reflection on the Westminster system. And this ruling was watched, of course, from around the world because Westminster is the mother parliament of so many of our parliaments. And of course, this unanimous ruling by the Supreme Court was read by Lady Brenda Hale. And when she delivered this ruling, she was in a black dress, fantastic dress, can I say, in a black dress with a spider brooch. And perhaps predictably, Twitter's response was completely fixated on the spider brooch rather than the sort of moment in the history of constitutions. And so people around the world started to wear spider brooches to show their support for a decision that confirmed that parliament is important and governments must be held to account even for difficult, complicated events like Brexit. The meaning of the spider in relation to Boris Johnson became a focus for tens of thousands of cascading tweets. So Brenda Hale became Twitter famous <laughs> at 75 years of age. But what is behind the brooch? What is behind this Twitter fame? And the answer is a person we can admire in difficult times. She reminds us of a different history of our universities, a different way of thinking about education and our educational lives. So let's remember the spider, but let's learn from Lady Hale. So I want to use today Lady Hale's story to offer a reminder of what education and what an educated life can bring to the world. She tells us some important lessons, some important reminders about the history of our universities. And if we make different decisions, we can be better and we can do better. Now, Brenda Hale had the safe middle class life, English life. And I put safe in inverted commas because it wasn't as safe as it appeared. She was the child of two teachers born in Yorkshire. Respect to all my friends in Yorkshire. Yorkshire in the UK. She studied law at Cambridge, gained first class honours and was called to the bar in 1969. Okay, so they are the facts. The narrative, if you will, of achievement. But there's a story that moves in and out of this narrative about the life of a woman of achievement. If you read her narrative and you see the stories within it, she was the first. She was the youngest. She was the only woman appointed throughout her career. Astonishing. So for those who have been the first, they make the lives of the people who follow better and simpler and faster, and we must honour them. Brenda Hale spent nearly 20 years working as an academic, a lecturer at Manchester University, and she was also a part-time barrister. But she was like so many of us, 
after we finished our qualifications. She managed to get herself into an academic job and she found herself simply teaching far too many courses, far too many students, but still trying to make a difference. But what makes her extraordinary is while she was teaching all these courses, she made a decision to continue to research. Now, why that particularly matters is law research is complex. It is different. It is a different mode of research, I would argue, from the rest of the university sector. So the notion that sort of the metrics we apply to physics or business can be applied to law, I would argue, is very inelegant and, in fact, wrong. And law textbooks are actually quite important, foundational to the field, whereas in other areas, textbooks just are pretty straightforward and pretty basic. Law textbooks are different. But even through this incredible teaching responsibility that she had as a junior academic, and I know all of you understand exactly what that is like, she made a decision to continue working and produce incredibly, wow, important research. And this is the lesson here, I think. It was that expertise and that research that gave her the profile to move her to the next stage of her professional life outside of the university sector. Now, she thought temporarily at first, but Brenda Hale has actually worked in the law outside of universities for most of her professional life now. But I also want to note the caveat there. She also was the Chancellor of the University of Bristol for a period of her career. And can I just do an editorial statement here? Good on Bristol. Love Bristol, got a lot of mates at Bristol. Good on Bristol for hiring an outstanding person as their chancellor, someone you can respect, someone you can admire, rather than a lot of the chancellors we see around the planet at the moment where they fit into a particular ideology of a particular government at a particular time. People we cannot respect for their decency and their integrity. They might be okay people but we can't respect them for living a transformative, transcending life. Brenda Hale has good on Bristol. She was the first and the youngest person to be appointed to the Law Commission in 1984. And during this time, she worked through and managed incredible transformations in family law. She was made Queen's Counsel in 1989 and became a judge in 1994. In 2004, Brenda Hale was the UK's first woman Lord of Appeal and became the Deputy President of the Supreme Court in 2013 and became President of the Supreme Court between 2017 and 2020. But what is so powerful, I think, about this story that seems of just incredible career success is throughout her life, she always acknowledged the doubts and the worries and the fears and the failures. At the start of her book, Spider Woman, she states, quote, we all have our imposter moments. I defy any woman to say she doesn't. Here are four of mine, <laughs> end of quote. So for Lady Hale, these moments of doubt in her life were punctuated by two questions. Quote, am I an imposter? Can I cope? Wow. So think about those questions in the context of your own life. We all have moments. A moment where we have to make a decision, yes or no. Do we jump forward? Do we jump back? Do we stay where we are? And at that moment we ask, am I an imposter? Can I cope? So what Lady Hale's life has shown is that she has always been able to cope. The greater question for me reflecting on this incredible person is, has that coping come at a cost? What her life has confirmed, I believe, is the power of expressing doubt. 
and yes, how all of us can overcome doubt. Her father died when he was 49 and she was 13. And her mother had not been allowed to teach because of the marriage bar. Those of you that haven't heard of the marriage bar before, married women in the public sector, but also in teaching local government, were not allowed to work, right? This is, so when you married, you were blocked from working in particular areas and professions. But after his death, Lady Hale's mother dusted off, to use that great verb, dusted off those teaching qualifications and began to teach once more to support the family, to bring in money in a supposedly stable and secure middle class life. Education for women is never wasted. So one of the most moving parts of the book Spider Woman is when Lady Hale reprinted a letter that her mother wrote, found after her mother's death, about how she felt at the time when her husband died. And firstly, can I say her mother, getting emotional now, her mother wrote magnificently and wrote about the desolation and the despair that she felt. And also what she described as the complete pointlessness of her life going forward. But she had responsibilities, and so she started to work, and she kept on working through the despair. Wow. Wenda Hale was drawn to the law with strong results in history, in Latin, and in French. And intriguingly, as she moved to Cambridge, she moved to Cambridge from her quite small town in Yorkshire with no stress at all. She stated, quote, I was not nervous going up to Cambridge. It was the culmination of everything I had been working towards for the past seven years. I knew how to study and work hard, end of quote. But she did note when she got to Cambridge what she described as, quote, the innate sense of entitlement from so many of the public schoolboys, end of quote. Innate sense of entitlement. This notion of being clever, but also being an outsider, was the foundation for her career. And it allowed her to see all the inequalities that existed and exist in our universities, in terms of class, but also in terms of gender. What was remarkable about her memoir, I think, is she offered a stunning view of our universities in the 1960s. There were no fees, <laughs> no tuition fees for students, and indeed the students that went to university received financial support. And the students completed two lectures for each subject in a week, and they would have a supervisory meeting with a personal tutor once a fortnight. And as Lady Hale was retelling her university days, she had a social life. She was a part of university groups, and it reads as quite a balanced life. My experience of university only a few decades later had no similarity with the story told by Lady Hale. I could not recognise the university life that she presented. Significantly, when she attained her remarkable first class honours result, she was able to get a law lectureship job at the University of Manchester. And Lady Hale spent 18 years teaching there. And considering the instability of the higher education workforce now, I think it's a really important reminder for us all to review Lady Hale's rendering of what a teaching and research academic was like at that time. She was absolutely an incredible law academic. And one of the stories I wanted to share with you, uh, and can I say this is outside of her public profile, this is outside of her book, is one of the tens of thousands of students that Lady Hale taught at the University of Manchester. Of course, one of them was my beloved late husband, Professor Steve Redhead. Right Now, the first time I heard the name Brenda Hale was from Steve, because she taught Steve Roman law, 
administrative law, for which he won a prize, and also family law. And before the biography, before the spider, indeed before Steve's own death, he used to tell me that the best teacher he'd ever seen was Brenda Hale. The only woman that taught him through his LLB, and you know the posh blokes everywhere were treating the students pretty poorly. They were toughening them up in the lecture theatre, calling them out, embarrassing them in front of their peers to sort of toughen them up to be a barrister. They were also humiliating them and behaving pretty badly, I would argue. Uh, but she was different. She taught them about the law rather than performing the privileges of being a lawyer. Brenda Hale remembers that when her degree ended in 1966, she was worried, as so many of us were and are worried at the conclusion of a degree, what's going to happen in my future? And hers was a gendered worry. Quote, I could see the way that brilliant academic women struggled for recognition. End of quote, 1966. I could see the way that brilliant academic women struggle for recognition. Not much has changed. But she got herself an academic job and she stayed there for 18 years. And this one woman in a law department dominated by men, she took teaching seriously and she taught well. And she offered a powerful reflection, I think, about the nature of university teaching. She stated that, quote, students learn most from being taught by people who are leaders in their field, end of quote. And she reflects on the nature of university teaching at the time, quote, teaching law in Manchester was hard work. Teaching methods were much the same as in Cambridge, but the students were expected to learn more in much more detail than we had done at Cambridge. And as junior lecturers, we were required to teach several subjects, end of quote. The crucial part, I think, of Brenda Hale's career, the lesson for us all, is that she never stopped researching. She had that enormous teaching load, like so many of you do, but published really innovative work, very courageous work, including a book on law and mental health in 1975, and parents, children, and the law in 1976. She also co-authored a remarkable book with Susan Atkins, Women and the Law. I recommend all these books to you. And she worked in the emerging legal area of social welfare law and particularly looked at the role of tribunals in social welfare law. She wrote about discrimination, but to be fair, she also lived it. As a legal academic in the 1960s, she recognised, she saw the everyday discrimination. You know, she wasn't able to go to particular law events because she was a woman. And of course, equal pay for equal work was a few years, nay decades in advance. But significantly in her teaching and research, I'm so inspired by this, she investigated the notion of domestic violence. And through her career, she problematised the word domestic. She showed how the word domestic rendered the violence a private matter between a husband and a wife. And she argued it was not a private matter between a husband and a wife, but a public matter about the protection of citizens. The important bit of this story, I think, is all these remarkable publications were written around teaching. And then, because she'd had the courage and written these publications, that enabled the next stage of her career as a law commissioner. So this is important. Anybody who tells you that publications don't matter, hell. Anybody tells you that books don't matter, remember the story of Lady Hale. They are wrong. They are wrong and use Brenda Hale as the basis of your alternative argument. She was an academic in the professions, and this is really important, because academics in the professions, I'm talking medicine, veterinary science, but also law, are too often treated as second-class professionals, if you will. You know, you couldn't cut it in the profession, so you taught the profession. That is offensive, 
and it also happens to be wrong. The academics, the scholars who teach in the professions in our universities are brilliant humans, they are transformative humans, and they're so important because they actually create the future of the professions. But also, please remember Brenda Hale's example. No matter how big, expansive her teaching responsibilities were as one of the few women in law at Manchester, she worked hard, she published the research, and that research then moved her to the next stage of her career. So don't let anyone convince you that the teaching and research academic, somebody who does both, that that is in the past. The teaching and research academic is the gold standard. We need to get back there. The amazing part of the story is that Hale continues to talk about her failures. She reported, and this is a moment for all of you out there who have been knocked back from a series of jobs or restructured out of organisations in the last few years. I see you, I hear you, I'm with you. And Brenda Hale stated, hang on to yourself, I had been turned down for professorships in three universities. If any had accepted me, I would not have had the life I have lived. End of quote. So firstly, <laughs> how ridiculous of those three universities to turn down a future law lord for a job. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Decker Beatles, anyone. Hope that's gone well for you. But I think that life lesson is so, so meaningful. The failures, the rejections, the barriers, the obstacles actually create the path to success. The knockbacks create the success because they require alternative ways of thinking and seeing alternative pathways. There are so many inspirations from Lady Hale. There's so much to her life, her teaching, her research, her influence, her legacy. And for me, so many of her statements challenged me to my very core. She described herself as a feminist. She was not pro-discrimination, and she argued, what does that word mean anymore? And I agree with her. But she asks, we don't think about pro-discrimination. We think about selection criteria for jobs and how we make appointments. And we think about our assumptions of merit, of standards, of what is a normal career trajectory. She also affirmed the importance of women claiming space. Quote, women should not feel obliged to conform to male expectations. End of quote. I don't know about all the women who are watching the video today, but that statement created a poignant moment for me thinking about my own life. And I've realised probably through most of my life, in fact, to be honest, I think all of my life, I have conformed to the expectations of men. Tough life lesson, that. And similarly for the men who are watching my words today, how often have you lived with or worked with or befriended a woman who did not conform to your expectations? of being a woman. And of course now we've got all sorts of new and important spaces to consider about identity between men and women, reality and expectations. But besides believing in meritocracy and believing in education, Lady Hale continued to live through the mantra, I think it came from Luke 12:48, I think, to whom much is given, much will be required. And Lady Hale stated, quote, this, is, this challenged me, it's challenging me deeply, quote, if we think we can do a job, we are letting the side down if we do not grasp the opportunity when it comes our way, end of quote. Again, 
provocative statement to walk through your own life. When we say yes to an opportunity, I've always argued we're saying no to other trajectories and other alternatives. For me, I've always argued every yes has a cost. Every yes will present us with a bill. Brenda Hale has lived a transformative life. She's lived through generations where married women had difficulty getting a job and staying in work, where ladies would retire after dinner while men would have their port and conversation. Now, these were the realities of the generations before us. And my, my own mother, for example, couldn't get a bank loan without a signature from my father and her working life was radically restricted because she was married. This is not ancient history. This is within the lived memory of our families. But these new opportunities that we all have present different costs. There are two deaths in Lady Howe's book. The first is obviously the death of her father, when she was 13 and the focus of that part of the book is on how her mother had to work and work hard so that the girls were not thrown into poverty. But the emotional cost of that death on the daughter and the family was unwritten. But there is a second death in the book. In the afterword, the last few pages of the book after the spider ruling. And so she reported that she retired on January 19, 2020, just before her 75th birthday. But also mentioned in the afterword was her husband, Julian Ferrand, a professor of law at Manchester as well. In fact, a two-time remarkable dean of law at Manchester. And he died of a pulmonary elbowism on July 17, 2020. So yes, he died during COVID. So 30 people gathered outdoors for that funeral. Now that second death shook me. When the book finished, I sort of had a bit of a cry and had a bit of a shake. It shook me and it made me reflect on the costs of saying yes the costs of taking up opportunities. She had six months of retirement with her husband before he died. And to be honest with you, that is my nightmare. To work a hard life and then at the moment of that life where you can take the beautiful walks, you can breathe, you can read, you can have conversations with the person that you love most in life. At that point, all those possibilities are cheated by death. And that may be the key decision that we have to make as human beings, not just women or men or non-binary identifying colleagues, not the trans community. This is the key decision we have to make as human beings. What is the cost of success? What is the cost of ambition? What is the cost of our opportunities? on others. Brenda Hale has lived a life of courage and of questioning. And remember, she started that book with those great questions. Am I an imposter? Can I cope? And she went through her life not only able to cope, she was thriving. This is a woman as influential as Ruth Bader Ginsburg and in Spider-Woman there is a, a beautiful photograph of these two remarkable women, these women of law who changed the world. Tough women, women who worked hard, women of courage, 
both, interestingly, who married lawyers. And both had the gift of recognising their moment. They recognised in real time their opportunity. But they also had the courage, the training, the education and the work ethic to take and occupy their moment. Our choices, our struggles will be different. To feel, to hope, to care, to think, to learn. But our choices and our struggles are based on the life and the courage of people like Brenda Hale. Makes you really proud to be an academic, eh? I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.